Positive heads out there. Thanks for tuning your beautiful brain waves into another episode of the Positive Head Podcast, where we are firmly convinced that creating success and happiness is rooted in understanding the ultimate nature of reality and the fact that as human beings, we are all immensely powerful fractals of the one and only source consciousness which creates and animates all things. After years of exploring this awe-inspiring truth on this podcast, I'm super, super excited to announce that we are now going even deeper down the rabbit hole on the new late-night-style consciousness-elevating talk show called Optimistic, which features none other than you, the listeners. Optimistic is taped out of the epic spaceship-esque eight-bedroom property we call the Mystic Manor that myself and the rest of the Optimistic crew now navigate reality from in Venice Beach, California. And you are invited to come experience a Mystic Manor Immersion Week with us. During your week-long stay, you'll enjoy unique workshops, chef-prepared meals, one-on-one time coaching and consulting with me, and even co-creating magic with me as a guest on both Optimistic and an episode of the Positive Head Podcast. When I started this, my aim with these immersive retreats was to facilitate the ultimate spiritual upgrade and tune-up, so to speak, uh, for our guests while providing them with one of the most memorable experiences of their lives. And I'm happy to say that as of this recording, every guest at the end of their trip so far has told me that they have had a profound and transformational experience at the Mystic Manor and that they definitely want to come back. All that being said, we only have a limited number of spots available between now and next July. And as of this recording, about half of those spots are already filled. So if there's any part of you that is screaming, yes, I want to come, I feel like I need to be there, go now and book a slot with me to discuss how we can put our heads together and make it happen at calendly.com forward slash talk with Brandon. I know for some people, there is also that little voice in their head saying, why not? You know, I can't get off work. I can't afford it and on and on and on. But, you know, really, Henry Ford, I think, said it best. Whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. And I'm confident that where there's a will, there's a way. And I'm personally committed to doing everything in my power, including discounts and payment plans to get you here if it is something that truly feels like a huge yes for you energetically and like you're meant to be here. Once again, the link to book time to discuss with me is calendly.com forward slash talk with Brandon. That's spelled C-A-L-E-N-D-L-Y dot com forward slash talk with Brandon. All one word, of course. And uh, yeah, book in some time and look forward to seeing you soon here at the Mystic Manor. All right, all you positive heads, on this week's Soul Share episode, I'm very excited to have Dr. James Gordon here with me on the show. James is a Harvard trained psychiatrist, former researcher at the National Institute of Mental Health, and chair of the White House Commission on Complementary and Alternative Medicine Policy, as well as a clinical professor of psychiatry and family medicine at Georgetown Medical School. Hold on, wait, there's more. Also an author of 10 books, the most recent of which is called Transformation, uh, which explores how to discover wholeness and healing after trauma. Hello there, James. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Yes, yes, we are. We are doing it after a little bit of technical uh, mishap at first. We are we are connecting here, and I'm super excited to, to pick your brain about uh, all the wonderful work you've been up to in the world. I, I like to start with a very predictable opening question, as my listeners uh, well know, and it is this: You're in an elevator. Uh, the woman next to you looks over, says, "What's your passion?" You have ten floors to answer. What do you say? My passion is being here on the elevator with you. Just relaxing and enjoying this time. 
Enjoying the ride. I like it. I like it. Fair enough. I like, I've never got that answer. That's a good one. Okay. So let's, uh, if you could, um, you know, James, just give us a little bit of uh, backstory, uh, if you would, how you ended up doing the work that you're doing. And um, I always like to get a little context if possible. Sure. Well, uh, I'm a psychiatrist, which meant I became a physician first. And I was always interested in people's stories. And uh, one of the reasons I became a physician, I think the clearest sense I had was from early on, I wanted to be helpful to people by being there with them, for them, listening to their stories, and helping them better understand themselves. So I, I had that sense pretty much right from the beginning of medical school, which was in uh, 1962. And at the same time, I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be there in times of crisis and be able to deal with physical issues as well as psychological issues. So that's why I became a psychiatrist rather than a psychologist. I always, and I thought for a while, maybe I'd be a surgeon. Uh, I liked working with kids. Maybe I'd be a pediatrician. And what I've managed to do over the years is to be in situations where people have very significant needs, where they're sharing their stories with me is a beginning of a process of healing. And then over the last 50 years or so, there are a whole... Um, a whole kind of spectrum of techniques and tools that I've learned to use to teach people how to understand and take care of themselves. So I've, there's been a kind of shift from my original idea, which was I'm going to be a psychiatrist, I'm going to listen to stories, I'm going to help people understand themselves, to something even more interactive with much more of the responsibility and the authority uh, with the patients uh, whom I'm there to help. So always from the beginning, I'm teaching people how to understand and help themselves and how to use specific tools, different kinds of meditation, guided imagery, self-expression and words and drawings and movement, uh, use of written dialogues for people who can write, biofeedback, all kinds of tools and techniques that people can use for themselves. And I think it's a very different, it's, it's a, a, a model, yes, I'm a physician, I'm a psychiatrist, and but I'm really seeing myself in many ways as a teacher and a companion and a guide for people on their life's journeys and helping them see that even the greatest challenges, the trauma, which is a Greek word that means injury, even the traumas mm. that come to them, the challenges that come to them, and perhaps especially those challenges are opportunities for learning and growth. So right. in, in a sense, rather than being a, an obstetrician and sort of de delivering the baby with all kinds of um, tool, all kinds of uh, equipment. I'm more like a midwife helping people to birth their new selves in a sense and giving them the tools. to mm. birth. I love that. I love that. Yeah. I often say on the show, you know, everything is happening for you and not to you. And I think when you're, especially when you're dealing with something like, you know, trauma, that is much easier said than it's like, oh, that sounds really great, you know, and I'm over here dealing with this trauma. So, you know, uh, I don't know, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's really a challenging thing to integrate for anyone. Um, and of course, that's what your whole new book, uh, latest book is about. And so I, I would love to just like get your, you know, as deep as you'll want to go into, you know, sort of uh, that whole, you know, process and sort of the, I know you, you, you kind of do step-by-step evidence-based journey on how to, how to, you know, navigate this extremely challenging um sort of, uh, you know, I guess it's sort of like a, it's a, it's a part of some, as you say, it's something that we all go through and, uh, write a passage as a human being to deal with and, and process trauma. So yeah, I, I'd love to, to, to dig into that with you. Sure. I, you know, I think that that first point is, is the one I make right at the beginning of the book that all of us are going to have trauma. This is not just something that happens to people who are in a war or who have, you know, horrendously abusive families or who've been raped or assaulted. Trauma is going to come to us. That's part of the nature of being human. It may come early in life because of poverty or discrimination or a neglectful or abusive family. If it doesn't come then, it's going to 
likely come when we become uh, teenagers or young adults and we face losses, losses of a love, for example, or losses of a sense of ourselves and you know where we're headed in life, or perhaps a significant physical injury, a uh, parental illness, a uh, major disappointment. All of those are traumatic events. And if it doesn't happen in early adulthood or, or midlife, it's certainly going to happen as we grow older. We're going to become, if we're lucky enough to grow older, our bodies become frail. We have a sense of loss. We're dealing with the loss of people we love. That's inevitably going to happen. And we're dealing with our with our own death, which is perhaps, the for many of us, the greatest trauma of all. So trauma is a part yeah. of life. And, and th- that may sound discouraging, but it actually winds up being uh, encouraging and supportive because we're all in this together. One of the terrible things about being traumatized, whatever the cause, is we feel so alone. And that's a kind of function of the way our biology works. We kind of shut down. And it's important right from the get-go to know that trauma is going to come. And then the second piece that's critically important is to know that there are ways to move through and beyond trauma to uh, not only Mm -hmm. become more resilient, but to see it as the potential door to greater wisdom, greater understanding, more of a sense of meaning and purpose, and greater compassion for both other people and for oneself. So that's the that's the place to begin with. This is and this is not just you know my understanding. This is really built into uh, sort of all of the indigenous cultures that I know of around the world from earliest times. It was understood the trauma was something that we could deal with, that would come to us, and that we could learn from and grow through. So that's where I start. And then I move into teaching, and we can do that now, beginning to teach some techniques to give my readers, people who are reading the transformation, as well as people I work with here in the field, uh, the experience of being able to make those positive changes. That's crucial too. Not just enough to have right. to say it's possible, not even enough, although I tell plenty of inspirational stories and I provide scientific evidence. I think in the long run, which all of which sets the stage, but in the long run, we, we need to know for ourselves for sure that we can make a difference in how we feel. And so that's where the specific yeah. tools and techniques come in. Yeah, that's that's absolutely crucial i would say because you know someone who is is processing trauma and is sort of feels like okay this is what my life is going to be and like you said it can lead to the sense of isolation and feeling alone and you know if you don't have that proper perspective on it like okay this is to some degree a rite of passage uh, yes it's my own unique you know, version of a traumatic experience. Uh, And, you know, and if, but if I understand that, like, this is something like, oh, everyone is going through to some degree. And if they haven't, they will. And I think you make a great point. And the ultimate trauma is losing everything we know. Our life is inevitable for every one of us. And so, you know, I feel like that at least helps to give the context and create fertile ground for the opportunity for healing and transformation to, to, to transpire. Exactly. And, and, and then there are specific tools. So I, I begin with um, teaching people soft belly breathing, breathing slowly and deeply in through the nose, out through the mouth with our bellies soft and relaxed. So if listeners can do this just for a couple of minutes while I'm talking, they'll, they'll begin to get a sense of what this is about. This is technically a concentrative meditation because we're concentrating on the breath coming in through the nose and out through the mouth, perhaps on the word soft as we breathe in and belly as we breathe out and on the feeling of our bellies relaxing and being soft. And as we do this for a few minutes, what begins to happen is we start entering a state of relaxation. Breathing slowly and deeply like this in through the nose and out through the mouth with the belly soft and relaxed. More air comes to the bottom of our lungs. 
there's better oxygen exchange, more oxygen moves into the bloodstream, and feeds all the cells and helps with regeneration of cells that have been damaged by trauma, including the cells in our brain. When we breathe slowly and deeply like this in through the nose and out through the mouth, it activates the vagus nerve, that's V-A-G-U-S. Vagus means wandering in Latin. And this is a big nerve that wanders up from our belly, through our chest, back to the central nervous system, to the brain. It slows heart rate, lowers blood pressure, relaxes the big muscles in our body that are tensed to fight or to flee, to to run away. And it improves digestion. And breathing slowly and deeply like this, activating the vagus nerve, quiets the storm that's going on in the amygdala. That's A-M-Y-G-D-A-L-A, which is a part of the emotional brain responsible for fear and anger. And breathing slowly and deeply like this brings more activity to the frontal part of the cerebral cortex, to areas of the brain responsible for thoughtful decision-making and self-awareness and compassion. So when we're breathing like this slowly and deeply, in through the nose and out through the mouth, we're creating an antidote to the fight or flight response, which is activated in trauma. We're quieting the body, calming the mind, allowing ourselves to focus and to think more clearly, to be more self-aware, and making it possible for us to have compassion for ourselves and also to have compassion for and connect with other people. So doing this, we've done it maybe for three or four minutes here, maybe not even that much. People, listeners may already feel a little bit of relaxation. What I suggest is you begin doing this, and I describe this uh, pretty clearly in the transformation, do this for 10 minutes to begin with and see what happens. And when I've done this many places uh, in communities that have been racked by violence with people who've been sexually assaulted with uh, after wars and climate related disasters and also during wars even during wars 70 or 80 percent of people who do this for 10 minutes will notice a change maybe they are aware that their heart rate is a little slower maybe their shoulders are a little relaxed they feel calmer more present when they open their eyes the room looks a little brighter and other people seem a little more a little more present, a little more real. So what happens is people experience, the vast majority of people, even doing this the first time, experience a positive change. And they also know from their own experience that they have the capacity to make a positive change. And this is a crucial mm-hmm. beginning when we're dealing with trauma, because when we've been traumatized, whatever the cause is, most often we feel, well, I can't do anything. I I feel helpless. I feel hopeless. And I've certainly been there in my life, and uh, just about everybody has. And this one technique gives you the felt understanding. You know it in your bones and in your breath that you can make a change in how you feel. So you're not helpless. And you're not hopeless because if you can make one change, and our mind understands this, if we can make one change, then, well, certainly possible we can make other changes. So this is the way I began right. creating a kind of uh, physiological and psychological balance that provides the platform from which everyone can begin to learn all of the other techniques and tools for moving through trauma. Yeah. You know, and what I love about this is, like you just said, it, if if you can, if you acknowledge, it's like, oh, there only has to be one white swan for them all not to be black or whatever. You know what I mean? It's like, well, give me one example of something that creates hope. And now I have something 
to, to the snowball is rolling. And, you know, with, with your breath, I mean, as simple as that is, as a suggestion, it's like, you know, we all, oftentimes we get so complex in our, in our an- analysis of things and, and, and overthinking how to, um, change our state. And, you know, I think at Tony Robbins, he talks about this a lot, this sort of thing, like doing different things physically to change your state. And it, it's, it's such a simple technique and yet I, I truly believe it is, you know, um, also when you think about like the, the idea that, okay, the, the more, uh, the deeper my breath is like sort of a reflection or symbolic of the more that, uh, of my capacity to sort of carry the weight of my, my life or the world in a sense. So it's like, the, the, you know, the more, if I'm bre- you know, if anyone is breathing super shallow, we know, you know, if you're upset or angry or any of those things, you pay attention to your, your breath. And it's like, it's super sal- shallow and fast and the it's kind of the opposite of what you just suggested. So this is like probably like 101, the simplest thing that we, we overlook to, to change our state. And, the, you know, the more that we can, we can process with, with our breath, the, the, the more I truly believe, you know, the, 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 the more capacity we have to, to carry, you know, all the, all the things that come with life, all the stresses of, of life. Absolutely. And it is, it is simple. And there's no reason why it shouldn't be simple. We do make yeah. things very complex. The other thing is, you know, you, you mentioned breathing shallowly. Well, if if uh, if any of our listeners want to do the experiment, just breathe shallowly for a couple of minutes. It'll start making you anxious. It's very the yeah. connection is so clear. And I think right. this it's more, you know, it's important to say that this works. It's important to say to let people know that change is possible, which is why I tell a number of inspirational stories about people who have been transformed by using this program who have trans created the opportunity for transformation for themselves but at the same time uh, and there's scientific evidence if you breathe like this we know if you breathe slowly and deeply like this for oh maybe as little as 20 minutes a day uh, you can change functioning in your brain you can even change brain structure and grow new brain cells the research is coming out on that and that's very important and it's very convincing and we need to have the experience ourselves. And so putting those together, right. the inspiration, the science, and the personal experience provides a, a kind of foundation. And it's important, you know, even in situations, sometimes people will say, well, that, okay, but you, you know, what about the, you know, what about the war that's going on? Or what about the fact that I don't have a job? Uh, th- you're breathing this way doesn't change that. And I said, no, you're right. It doesn't change it but it puts you in a place of balance and then you can use all of the other techniques to begin to look at better ways to relate to these situations that seem and sometimes are so overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It makes you, if if you're in a angry, frustrated, super depressed, you know, whatever state you're, you're really, you know, functioning um, with a handicap. Exactly. To, to, to deal with, you know, with your life. And alternatively, it's like, you know, if you're in the middle of something that's super challenging and you're able to then, you know, c- come to this calm center in the eye of the storm, be the eye of the storm, so to speak. You know, there's a major power that comes from that. It's like, wow, I, you know, I am. I am uh, upgrading my capacity as a human and and as a result I get to graduate to the next level of of uh, potentiality as a human and it, it, you know that's how I think of my life personally in this sort of like gamification kind of like okay it's you, you don't play good sit down and play the video game and there's no there's no obstacles to overcome and if i if i view it in that way and if i overcome the obstacles i get to another level of experience that is more robust more rewarding you know vaster et cetera. Et cetera. yeah that's that's interesting i think that's that's exactly right that is and that is what can happen, and and we need to know that that can happen. Yeah, yeah, I think that 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 is sort of the the hope element, you know, 
that uh, I think for a lot of people it's 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 missing. And you know, I, I'd be curious what you say to the person who is who is you know depressed or you know. Uh, experience trauma because they've experienced trauma or, or, you know, lost a, a loved one. Maybe, uh, you know, there are a lot of people with relationships and that really trips them up. You know, the, 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 the here they had their best friend in the world and, you know, they're madly in love with this person and all of a sudden, you know, it's over and they're left holding the bag and can't seem to move on. What would your, you know, what is your, your, what do you say to that person who just, you know, has that look in their eye of like, I just, you know, I don't have the fight left in me. I don't, I'm just, you know, so lost in it. I don't even, I can hardly hear what you're saying. Well, you know, I, I don't, I don't try to convince them really of, of anything. I give them, I listen, I honor that loss. I've been, you know, I've been through it myself. I understand how devastating and, uh, and debilitating it can be. You feel like, oh, you know, who am I? And I, as you say, I've lost my best friend and I don't know who I am anymore. And uh, What do I do and how do I move forward? And I feel weak and I feel anxious and I feel worried all the time. So, okay. And let me teach you something that can make a difference. And so I would begin by teaching, just as I did here, by teaching the soft belly breathing and giving the person an experience of a little bit of peace in the midst of yeah. all this anxiety and all this distress. The other thing that, uh, that, that I do with people who are, we mentioned depression and loss, physical activity is really important. Uh, any kind of physical activity can make a significant difference in the neurotransmitters that are often depleted in our brain when we're depressed. So for example, dopamine and serotonin and the endorphins, that any kind of physical exercise can help to make a change and those in a positive direction. So instead of rushing to take a pill to make it better, why not go for a walk or you know, go for go for a jog or go for a swim or just, you know, roll around on the floor, do something physical. And the yep. evidence uh, for the benefits of physical exercise for people who are, de who are depressed is uh, just about as good or better than the evidence for using antidepressant drugs. So pay yeah. attention to that and, and don't just rush to the drugs. The drugs are always there if other approaches don't work, but, but make that effort. And in the beginning, and I, I talk about this in the transformation, the effort may be, well, I, I really don't feel like moving at all. Start with walking half a block walking a block. And what happens yeah. is that people begin to see the difference they can make, and that encourages them to do more. Um, the, the, other, yeah. the other approach that, that I often use for depression and, and use for trauma and describe fairly early on in the transformation is uh, using expressive meditations. These are the oldest forms of meditation on the planet. The ones we're most familiar with now are concentrative meditations, like the soft belly breathing is one, or a mantra, a sound. Mantra is a Sanskrit word for sound meditation, or focusing on an image, or repetitive prayers or concentrative meditations. So that's one kind. And there's mindfulness meditation, becoming aware of thoughts, feelings, sensations as they arise, bringing mindfulness into all our activities, really basically a Buddhist meditation that we've updated in a variety of ways. Those are great, but there's a third kind of meditation called expressive meditations. And these are ones that actively move the body. Could be chanting, could be jumping up and down, could be whirling, fast, deep breathing. The one I teach right at the beginning of the transformation is shaking and dancing. And mm. there, again, it's very simple. And this is the kind of thing that indigenous people have done for millennia and that we've tend right. tended to have forgotten about in the modern world. So all you do is stand up and uh, with knees a little bit bent and start shaking from the feet up through the knees and hips and chest and shoulders and head just shake shake like crazy for five or six minutes then pause like a polaroid picture even <laughs> again look you can see it 
You can do it. It's it's uh, you can look at our the Center for Mind Body Medicine website. You'll see thousands of people doing this all over the world. People of every size, shape, color, age, and right. you shake the body. Uh, then you relax for a couple of minutes, and you put on some music that's energizing, and let your body move to the music. What this does, the shaking begins to break up the fixed physical and mental and emotional patterns that weigh us down, the tight, tense body. You know, I've been hurt and I've got to protect myself and the mind that keeps going over. Oh, I'll never be the same. Nobody else will ever love me. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've been there myself. and Nobody will care yeah. about me. Who am I? What am I doing? Those patterns start to become less, um, less constricting. And what happens often, we, I just did this with a group of 100 and 20 uh, health and mental health professionals uh, yesterday is emotions start to come up. All the things that we've held down that we need to let ourselves feel. Sometimes it's sadness, sometimes it's laughter, sometimes it's anger, whatever it is, everything we've held in begins to come up and we feel a certain release. And then we watch it as we stand for a couple of minutes, do a little bit of mindfulness. And then the music that we put on, which should be inspiring, energizing music, allows our body to express itself in the way it wants to. And that's part of our healing. This is a very powerful kind of healing and really should be part of any program for people who are dealing with any kind of trauma or depression or anxiety. And it's part and parcel of what I teach in the transformation. At first, it may seem a little weird or awkward. We're just not used to doing it. And I've been thinking yesterday, looking at these 120 people, some of the words, okay, fine, let's do it. Others are looking at me like, he's saying we should do what? And I said, just do the experiment, see what happens. And I have people close their eyes because it, uh, even if you're alone, it removes external stimulation. And if you're with other people, uh, it makes you uh, less likely to compare yourself or to worry if somebody's looking at you. So I say, everybody close your eyes. And you can do this with your eyes closed unless you have a problem with balance and then keep your eyes open and look at kind of neutral thing, look at a wall or look off into the distance. But it's a beautiful way to bring some energy back into exactly the kind of person that you described who's feeling so depleted, so discouraged. And it, it requires you put out some energy, but you get it back 10 or a hundred fold. Right, right, right. Um, how do you feel about, uh, you know, well, before I ask this question, you know, one of the things I just wanted to make a point of, uh, I, you know, you referenced the indigenous people shaking and dancing. And, you know, it's, it's funny to think about how often we've, you know, probably in the past that was looked at as like primitive or silly or, you know, like, uh, that sort of thing. And I've heard it said before, indigenous, you know, um, referring to, uh, you know, every, all the, all the Europeans that came over as like little brother, like, oh, you know, we, we think we've got all these things figured out, but really we're sort of immature in our understanding of a lot of things, uh, especially like spirit, spiritual centric kind of, you know, ultimate nature of reality questions and, and, uh, concepts. And so I, it's instantly what I thought of what popped into my head is like, you know, here's something that maybe my grandfather would have looked at and rolled his eyes. And now here's, you know, the Harvard trained, uh, psychiatrist saying, uh, this this is actually extru complete wisdom to be doing this stuff. And uh, I, I love that. <laughs> well, you know, they're, they're really our elder sisters and brothers. They've, yeah. they're, they're in touch with, not that they have the whole, you know, they know everything, but they're in touch with a very old truth that we've lost connection with. I was just talking with a couple of people last night, an American Indian woman and a Yazidi, you know, who's living, who's uh, from Iraq. And they're part of our training mm -hmm. program. And, you know, with both of them, we're talking about this fundamental connection to the earth that they have, this kind of wisdom uh, and that they, they too have begun to lose, to lose connection with. Their tribes have begun to lose connection. And that's been the great tragedy. And we're, you know, we're so far apart from that connection with our bodies and with the earth on which we're living. And these techniques help to restore that connection. And, yeah. um, you know, we do this, I work, uh, at, and my Center for Mind-Body Medicine team and I 
do a lot of work on Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, which is the second poorest county in the United States. And they've had they had a terrible epidemic of youth suicide. And we've been working there for uh, for the last four or five years quite intensively with, with very good results. But it's as much a learning for us. And we're putting together the whole program that's in the transformation, putting that together with some traditional Lakota ceremony. And it's a beautiful marriage. I mean, people, we all have so much to learn from each other. Why close off those possibilities? Or why, you know, sort of dismiss somebody as primitive or they don't know or we know better? We need to come together and explore what works and what doesn't work and what we all have to learn from each other. And that makes it so much right. more effective. And it's also more interesting. It's more fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd much rather be dancing around a, a fire, you know, uh, than sitting behind a desk uh, staring at a computer screen. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's fun. It is fun. And, and I think that's like the key to getting into that childlike state of wonder, understanding that you, you know, the more we know, the more we realize we don't know and approaching everything uh, with you know, a, a state of, um, you know, you know, uh, I, I heard someone say recently the, the, the sort of combination to never getting old is, um, is always having, maintaining this sense of curiosity along with the wisdom that you've gained. And if you're sort of resonating with those two things, you know, you may age, but you're not going to grow old. And I really love that. That's beautiful. You know, the Zen, the, the Zen, phrase for it is beginner's mind. Mm, yes. Yes. And, and the saying is in the expert's mind, there are very few possibilities. In the beginner's mind, the possibilities are infinite. So coming at it exactly as yes. you're saying with that kind of freshness and, okay, what do I have to learn? Now, when you really have been traumatized and you're, you're real down, of course, that's hard to do. But the techniques, the, the two that we've discussed, and it's really two out of about 25 that I describe and teach in the transformation, but those two, the soft belly breathing and then the shaking and dancing begin to bring us back into balance so we can appreciate what's actually happening right now. And that there are possibilities that seem closed off when we're depressed or really anxious or we've been traumatized, but those possibilities start to open up as our mind kind of comes into balance again. Right. How do you how do you feel about uh, emotional freedom technique, EFT or, or tapping, as it's referred to? The tapping techniques, I, you know, I um, people have told me that they're very helpful. Um, I've seen some of the research, some of the research that Dawson Church and others have done. I think there's there's something there. It's not one that, that I I don't include it in the basic program and the transformation. But at the end of the book. I have a, a kind of a pretty detailed section, an appendix, where I talk about a number of different therapies uh, that require a therapist uh, that can be effective, and I present the evidence for it. And I think tapping can be helpful. It's not, uh, and I've seen people uh, do it, and I know Dawson Church, and I've you know learned a little bit about how to do it. It's not one. So I think the thing is that if it's something works for you, why not? Yep. I mean, there's evidence. There's no doubt. There's no downside to it. The evidence is starting to accumulate that it may be effective. So if you if you're drawn to it, and I would say that about other therapies, it's uh, if you're drawn to something uh, that you think might be useful, well, check it out. What what I do yep. in the transformation is I, I I do my best not only to teach people the comprehensive program that that I have and that we have at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, which I regard as foundational, but also the message is always, here are some tools so that you can um, amplify and deepen your intuition and imagination. And as a therapy comes up or a possibility for helping yourself comes up, as somebody talks to you about it, as you read about it, go inside, read the material but ask yourself, is this right for me right now? And if it is, go for it. See what it's like. But be um, be critical at the same time. I think it's a balance between right. being open and critical. There's a yeah. Sufi saying, praise Allah, but tether your camel. That's a very good one. So, <laughs> so yeah, be open, 
but you know, don't be another saying is don't be have your head so open your brains fall out. Right, right. <sighs> Healthy sense of skepticism. Yeah, and if it, it if it works, be open to it. I, I teach a bunch of techniques to mobilize the imagination and intuition. And I always, you know, I I go inside and I ask. Uh, this is a guided imagery technique. I ask my wise guide, uh, which may represent intuition or imagination or my unconscious. Some people think it's a visitor from the spirit world. Doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't make any difference really how you think about it. We all have this capacity, if we can relax, to consult some kind of inner wisdom and get answers to questions like, should I do tapping or should I do something else? And it will start coming and do the experiment and then see if it's making a positive difference. If it is, fantastic. If it's not, yep. let it go. Yep. Yep. I love that. I love the the approach to it. And actually, I've had uh, – I have a good friend, Sonia Sophia, who runs the World Tapping Circle, who's been on – uh, quite a few as a co-host on the show. And um, sh- for those of you interested in exploring that technique, if you go to worldtappingcircle.com forward slash positive head, uh, a one word, and she has set something up for you guys to sort of explore it for, you know, there might even be something free on there. I can't quite recall, or it's very inexpensive to like join her, her, you know, tapping circle which happens live each monday with people all over the world tapping together and then you get access to like her past catalog of tapping for different traumas essentially is what it is and uh, you can learn if anything just learn more about eft if you're not familiar with it um so, yeah i know quite a few people who just swear by it you know and um so i think you're right it's like in different different things will work well for different people we're all you know, we all, you know, are, are unique in how we learn and how we process things. And so uh, definitely one to, to explore, I would say, as well. As you're talking, two things come to my mind. Uh, one is we are all unique. That's a biochemical fact. I mean, I, and yeah. this is, I have a whole chapter on the trauma healing diet. And what, one of the points, food can be very helpful. That was my next question. That was my very next right. question. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to, you were talking before we got on air about examples of synchronicity. Here we are. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Here we are. You're, you're so, yeah. going to ask the question and I'm thinking about it. But before I talk about that and the individuality there, the other thing I want to emphasize that you said is when you do things to help yourself with other people, that itself is healing regardless of which yep. technique you're doing with other people, just the being together, the sharing the experience and perhaps sharing some of the things that come up as you're helping yourself. So I just wanted to emphasize that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, that was exactly my next question as well. It's like, okay, you know, food, I think is another one that it can kind of turn into this, this spiral. If you're depressed, you're not getting up and moving your body. You're not, uh, you're, you're breathing shallow. You're eating ho-hos and Twinkies. Like, you know, this is probably not a good recipe, uh, to, to, to make those changes. And just even doing a small, what I feel, you know, tell me if you agree. Uh, but I feel even if someone just is, is makes a small change, like, okay, I'm not going to all of a sudden become raw vegan tomorrow. I'm depressed. Uh, as it is like you really want to depress me put a bunch of brussels sprouts in front of me and uh, you know but if someone will just take and you know make a small change okay i'm going to change one meal or instead of the you know french fries i'm going to have you know some broccoli or whatever it is and just i think even those small course corrections can then of course grow over time would you agree so, I, that's that's true, but I you know we we ought to back up a little bit when we're traumatized when we're going through an intensely stressful period. Either the tendency either is not to eat at all. Some people go in that direction. Other people will rush to the comfort food. They'll rush to the Twinkie, you know, yep. the ones you described, and that's understandable because those sugary, fatty foods give you jolts of particularly of sugar that help to raise the levels of serotonin, which is calming in your brain, of dopamine, which is the feel-good chemical, of endorphins, which help to mute the pain. Plus, um, when we're eating those kinds of very sugary processed foods, 
it subdues to some degree the memories that are torturing us. So first of all, understand that when you're rushing to eat the comfort foods, that, that there's a reason for it. It's not because you're a dope. It's because you're doing things that are making you feel better. Now, the problem is right. that the short-term answer is a long-term downer. And that quite literally, after a while, the serotonin starts going down, the dopamine goes down, the endorphins go down, the memories, the troubling memories start coming back. And then you try to eat more of the comfort food to keep them down, and it just doesn't work. And meanwhile, it's putting much more of a burden on your whole digestive system. Important thing for everyone to understand about trauma that is not in any of the books I've seen before, before, before I wrote The Transformation, is that trauma does so much to disturb our digestive functioning. I, I can't, it's a long chapter, and obviously I can't talk about all of it in a couple minutes, but just a couple of examples. One is that when we're under prolonged stress, when we've been traumatized, the villi, which are the little projections from the cells in our small intestine, get damaged. And those villi, those little finger-like projections, are how we absorb nutrients, vitamins and minerals. So we're not absorbing whatever we're eating. We're doing a much poorer job of absorbing nutrients when we're under stress. Second thing is the trauma tends to separate those cells that are lining the small intestine. And molecules of food that are in the small intestine that don't belong in the bloodstream, gluten is one of them, some of the proteins from milk are others, start leaking across the small intestine, going into the bloodstream, and they go everywhere in our body, and they can cause inflammatory reactions. And when they cause inflammation in the brain, they make it more difficult for us to think, they make us more anxious, they make us more depressed. That's because the gut is being damaged, the GI tract. Also, and again, we're just talking about the small intestine. There's one part of the gastrointestinal tract. Trauma and prolonged stress destroy the microbiome, the good bacteria in the gut. So many of those trillions of bacteria get destroyed. And so the bout, we're out of balance. Our inner ecology is out of balance. And when the microbiome is negatively affected, it negatively affects, and we're just learning this now, the vagus nerve, which I mentioned in soft belly, which goes back to the brain and is responsible for helping us deal with stress and trauma, helping us rebuild our damaged brain. So all those things conspire to deepen the trauma, to make us more depressed, more anxious. And if we can, first of all, know that, and then begin to eat in a healthier way and begin to add a basic program of supplements, we can rebuild our gut. And as we rebuild our gut, it will contribute in significant ways to rebuilding our brain and relieving us of the symptoms of trauma. And it's a process. So that's, that's the general yeah. outline. And it's, um, if we do that, you know, we have, again, it's one of those situations where we have everything to gain and we have nothing to lose. The worst thing that will happen is you're setting yourself up for good lifetime health. If you, for example, stop yep. eating all the processed foods or get rid of as many as possible, you don't have to be a fanatic, as you say, just as you said. You start where you yep. can. And the program, the trauma healing diet, is actually pretty easy to follow for most people. It's just a step-by-step guide to what you can eat. And for example, you don't have to stop eating meat red meat, but ideally you would eat less of it because red meat is yep. has omega-6 fatty acids, which are, among other things, which are pro-inflammatory. So they contribute to the inflammation in our gastrointestinal tract and our brain. So if you want to have some occasionally, okay, but don't eat it two, three times a day. It's not good for you, especially not good for you when you've been seriously traumatized. And, and again, the evidence is there and it's something that you can discover for yourself. Make the changes and see how you feel. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because both of the things that you brought up, I've done very little of promoting other, you know, products or, you know, um, 
programs on the show uh, as on an ongoing basis. And two of them that I have is the World Tapping Circle, and the other is a company called Purium that you may be familiar with. And that you know, it's all they have a product called Biomedic that's all about it's. Uh, proven to shown to uh, heal the gut from glyphosate damage, which, you know, a lot of people think, you know, the gluten intolerance is really linked to glyphosate, you know, Roundup weed killer that's been sprayed all over the planet essentially. And is in every thing we test. And so, yeah, any of you guys want to learn more about that? If you go over to positivehead.com forward slash transformation, there's a whole like plan of, you know, how to get, you know, superfoods easily into your system and, you know, healing your gut and all of that. And I even did a video a couple years ago all about it because it's something that I've, you know, uh, subscribed to a long time ago as far as my own regiment. And it's been wonderful, uh, especially with a really busy lifestyle. So, um, yeah, I would recommend maybe checking, checking that out to, to you guys, but, um, yeah, I think that's, a, that's a important to note, though. It's like you don't have to do crazy changes, like just start doing, yeah, like two to three times. I mean, I think of a friend who ate meat like that. He had steak every dinner, uh, you know, every day. And at 40 years old, had a heart attack. It's like, you know, and this was someone who had been like an NFL football player and super, you know, health conscious otherwise. And so it's... um you know, it's, it's, these little, little tweaks can make a big difference over time, huh? Yeah. And, and, and and the program and the transformation is, is easy to follow. And I think the other thing is if you, if you find yourself straying, I mean, there's, for example, it is definitely better to eat organic foods, but you may not have the the budget that can afford them. So that I list the, the organic food, the foods that are most heavily contaminated, those are the ones you want to focus on. The Environmental Working Group provides a list, which is there in the transformation. So focus on those foods. And if you eat something, you know, if you do eat a twink or two, don't don't condemn yourself. Enjoy the heck out of it if you do it. (laughs) Enjoy it and then, you know, get back on the wagon and do what you need to do. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I think that's a bit, that's a wonderful point because, uh, I, and I'm really glad you brought it up because I, I feel like a lot of times people, they, they, they hear all these things and then they're, let's say they're depressed tomorrow and then they go and they have, you know, the giant bowl of ice cream. And then they, not only did they take that into their system, uh, then they start beating themselves up for what they did, which is probably quite possibly worse than the act of eating the big bowl of you know ice cream or whatever so i think i think if you did whatever you've done love yourself there uh you know and whatever you do don't get caught in this loop of beating yourself up for whatever you have or haven't done because you are you know the journey is the goal and you are perfectly imperfect and in the process of uh, improving yourself and healing yourself. And you're, you're in it. I mean, we're those who I think sign up for life on this planet, you know, uh, are, are brave souls who agree to sort of trudge through a lot of this stuff. And, and, you know, I think if you can really just understand that, you know, you are worthy of your own self-love in regardless of your, your, you know, treadmill activity. <laughs> Yes, and the other the other thing that that, that I teach that, that is really important to bring into eating and selecting food and preparing food is, is mindfulness. So that there's a yes. instructions about mindful eating, and it, it can make a huge difference. So that, for example, if you do have the uh, the ice cream, you're you're not going to eat as much because if you start really tasting it and it tastes delicious, you don't need the huge bowl anymore. Right. What happens to people when what happens to so many of us? We're in such a hurry. Yeah. Um, you know, we taste the. I'm first guilty bite of that. And, I eat so and, fast. And then we look down at the plate. We taste the first two bites. Say, "Oh, that's really good." Then we look down at the plate. It's all gone. Where'd it go? We yep. weren't paying attention. Yep. So if you can yes. bring just a again, it's once again bringing the relaxation into the preparing the food, the eating the food, and just enjoying it more. Then we're gonna automatically start eating more sanely. 
Mm, yeah, I love that. That's a big one for me because I'm someone who sort of talks fast, thinks fast, you know, and slowing down. And that's why the breath, uh, focusing on the breath is so helpful for me because whenever I, if you bring yourself back to a slow, soft bellied breath, you can, it slows everything down in a very good way. I, I often think of the, um, the quote by Thich Nhat Hanh, I believe it is, who said, you know, walk as if your, your feet are kissing the earth. You know, and really like, wow, okay, think about that as you're racing around in a, in a fury, you know, okay, I'm going to be very mindful of how I'm moving. I'm going to be mindful of how I'm eating. I'm going to be mindful of, you know, how I'm speaking. And all of those things are going to lead to a state of calmness and serenity and, um, and just naturally help with a, a lot of these issues. Mm, yes, absolutely. And the whole, the whole program in, in the transformation is really about bringing that meditative attitude, that relaxed moment to moment awareness to, to every activity. Uh, I'm right at this moment, I'm here at, uh, Esalen, which is an incredibly beautiful retreat center in, in on Big Sur, California. But you know, the, it's not, it's wonderful to be here and to be in this nature, but it's also great just to walk along my street and be able to look at a tree or look at a flower and, and appreciate it. And I think it's, we need to bring that, as we bring that approach, that mindfulness into all the ordinary activities of our lives, they become very healing. So for example, walking in nature, it's a part of the program and the transformation. And there's now, you know, of long, thousands of years after indigenous people knew that about 35 years after some of us are 45 or 50 years after we made that discovery for ourselves, there's now science showing that if you take a little bit of time to walk in nature, you can reduce those thoughts that are torturing you, the technically r- ruminations, the repetitive thoughts, just by walking in nature for half an hour. We change the way our brain functions in an area of the brain called the subgenual cortex. Not main is not that important. Activity goes down. We're not obsessing about everything that's bad and everything that's gone wrong. Nature is somehow taking our burdens from us and we're restoring our yeah. connection with our bodies, with our minds, as well as with the natural world. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's such an interesting way to put it. Nature is like this. Uh, you know, this medicine in itself, I think of a, like a commercial, like a video I saw not too long ago that was really great. And it was like, you know, they, they made it uh, very much like one of these, you know, drug ads you see on TV, but the, the product was nature, you know, <laughs> and it was just so brilliant. It's so good and true. And, you know, I just saw someone post something the other day and I didn't have the time to read it, but they were talking about how, you know, evidence suggesting that we actually can get energy from sitting with a tree and being with it, putting our hands on it and, you know, like getting chi from the tree, so to speak. And I I didn't go read it and see, you know, exactly how much, uh, you know, how grounded this idea was. But, um, you know, they're seeing all this interesting information about how trees actually communicate with each other and have, you know, or these living entities that share families and all of these things and, and sending signals to each other through their root systems when there's, you know, something to be aware of or whatever. And it's, it's really fascinating when you think like, oh, wow, there's life all around you that wants to support you and help you through this, this process of, of becoming the next greatest and greatest version of yourself. If we will just lift our eyes, you know, and, and, and start exploring with that, that childlike curiosity. Exactly. Beautiful. And, you know, and also sort of another aspect of nature that can be really important for healing. And I have a chapter in the transformation on this as well is being connected to animals. Uh, Yes. You know, there have been some really stunning research showing one, one piece of research on people who had heart attacks and those people who had heart attacks who also had pets were far more likely to survive far longer than those people who didn't have pets. Otherwise, they were compared scientifically and there were no differences. That was the difference, having that pet, having that connection with this other living being from a, you know, kind of a a, a different species. So it's, you know, there, there is, as you're saying, all of nature is there to offer us 
this incredible bounty, healing bounty, if we just, you know, are willing to avail ourselves of it. Yes. Wow. Well, this has been really amazing. As we sort of uh, wind down here, you know, uh, James, I, I'd love to hear you'd mentioned, you know, a lot of stories that you have. And, uh, you know, the listeners know any good s- inspiring story, synchronicity, serendipity, positive paranormal story, just a story of healing, anything that you think would be, um, you know, well received uh, and inspirational to, for the listeners to hear. I'd, I'd love I'd love a little story time from from Dr. Gordon. Sure. Well, first of all, the more relaxed you are, the more you use the kinds of techniques I teach in the transformation, the slow, deep, soft belly breathing, the shaking and dancing, the more you kind of bring yourself into balance, the more likely these events, these synchronistic events, these meaningful coincidences are, are, are likely to happen. And the more aware you're going to be of them, when they do happen, they happen very, very frequently. Just the uh, just the other day, we're we're out here where the communication's not so great uh, here in the in, in kind of in the wilderness, and um, Tatiana, who's my assistant, uh, and I have walkie talkies, and they said that our some of our other staff said, "Okay, okay, Jim, what what you have to have a you have to have a code name if you're going to be on a walkie talkie." And just spontaneously came to my mind, my code name is going to be Licorice. I don't, who knows where that came from. Then <laughs> I discovered that Tatiana, totally independently, her code name was Twizzler. So <laughs> Licorice Twizzler, I mean, we're this. What? Can, That's amazing. <laughs> we've been working together for a year and a half or so. So we're really to, somehow. There's some kind of communication that has nothing to do with words, nothing to do with planning, that we came up with these completely complementary code names independently. That's so that's that's amazing. One example just from from yesterday. Um, another example is I, I, mean, I think that if we are willing to open ourselves to these possibilities, that remarkable truths can come. When I was in um, South Africa many, many years ago, 20, 23, 24 years ago, I spent, uh, I spent some time with a, a quite remarkable Sangoma, traditional Zulu healer named Credo Mutwa, M-U-T-W-A. And then uh, my partner and I, we were with Credo for three days, three full days learning from him, learning about the, the stories of his people, the stories about the plants, experiencing the plants, experiencing the ritual. And on the final afternoon of our visit, he said to me, uh, would you like to see your future? And with some anxiety, I I said, "Uh, okay. He said, well, here, what we do here is we hollow out a rock, and it's a rock about the size of, of my fist. And we hollow it out with a wooden dowel. We rub the dowel back and forth on the rock. So it takes a long while to hollow it out. And then when the sun is setting, and he he was telling me this just as about as the sun was setting, you look through the hole in the rock at the setting sun and you will see your future. So wow. I looked through the hole in the rock and I saw two slopes kind of like two cliffs coming toward each other at the bottom and there's bright orange of the sunset behind them the cliffs were black and then i saw little figures coming down both sides both sides of the cliff coming down toward the bottom and i they thought they looked like ants and then i looked a little bit more closely and they were humans and i realized wow. that my future was going to be bringing very different people together, people from different continents, people from different races, people of different ages. That was going to be my future. This is 23, 24 years ago. And then I forgot about it. And then about 10 years later, in the middle of traveling to the Middle East to work with Israelis and Palestinians together, oh, it's happening. This is this is exactly wow. what I saw. And a lot of the work that I do, aside from working with individuals here in the United States and training people here in the United States through the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, a lot of the work we do is 
overseas with people who've been through wars, with people who've suffered terribly from climate-related disasters. And we're bringing the tools and techniques that I teach and the transformation to these people. We're bringing our Western world to the non-Western world, and we're learning from the Western world, and we're bringing together people like Israelis and Palestinians who don't, you know, who've had significant difficulties getting along with each other. We're helping them to come together in our programs and come to understand each other better. So, well, this is interesting. This is the future that I saw 20 some years ago in a little hut in a, on a game preserve in South Africa. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Um, well, I applaud the work that you're doing, Dr. Gordon. This has uh, been such an inspiring conversation. And I think it's very, I, what I love about it, it's such a grounded and powerful approach that, you know, you, you, these simple, simple but powerful steps and uh, ways to sort of approach and, and view this, you know, this um, issue that, like you say, it, everyone is going to have their day with uh, at some point in their life. So I, I applaud your work. And I know those uh, those people out there listening, all the listeners would like to, many of them would love to continue to follow your work. And what is the best way for for them to do so well the first thing is is to read the book the transformation discovering wholeness and healing after trauma so much of the information is in there all the practical information you need to use this program of of healing and of creating more possibilities more joy in your life if you want to see the work how we're using this program in communities all over the united states uh, you can look at the Center for Mind Body Medicine website, CMBM, Charlie Mary, Betty Mary dot org. And there we have descriptions of work we're doing on the Pine Ridge Reservation, work we're doing after Hurricane Harvey in Houston, after the wildfires in California and Puerto Rico, after the hurricanes with U.S. vets and active duty military. All the information about our work is there. We have uh, people we've trained. Uh, trained probably about 4,000 people in the United States and close to 7,000 around the world who can help you with this program and the transformation, who are leading groups or working with individuals using this same approach that's there in, in my book. We also have online groups that you can join. We have a sliding scale for those so we don't turn anyone away. We want to make this work as widely available as possible. And we have training programs, training programs for health and mental health professionals. But we invite others. If you're a teacher or a community organizer or you want to do a volunteer in your church or synagogue or mosque or you're a part of a women's group, whatever, if you want to learn how to use this work with yourself, read the transformation. If you want to also be able to use this with other people, we strongly suggest you come to our training programs. You can also follow me, James Gordon, MD. That's uh, my website. That's my Twitter. That's my Instagram. So you can see pictures of me and of our team as we do work in many places around the world. And we're, we're here to serve. Um, this is where a non Center for Mind Body Medicine is a nonprofit. And we're here to make what we've learned, what I've learned over the last 50 years, which is there in the transformation, what we've learned as a center over the last 30 years, as widely available as possible. So this, this uh, I, I appreciate your having me on, Brandon, because it gives me a chance to issue the invitation to you and to all the listeners to check out what we're doing. And if you want to be part of it, please get in touch. We're a growing, Wonderful. healing community. Wonderful, wonderful work that you're doing. I do have one last uh, question for you. And that question is this. In 60 seconds or less, what is the meaning of life according to Dr. James Gordon? The meaning of life is sitting here, enjoying being with you, breathing deeply and feeling connected to my body and to everything that's around me. And we are doing it. And thank you so much for leading the charge, Dr. Gordon. This has been incredible. All of you out there listening, love you so, so much. Until next time, journey well.
And if you're feeling the call to come for a week retreat style mystic manner immersion, remember to go now and book your time to speak with me directly about stepping into the optimistic vortex at calendly.com forward slash talk with Brandon while there are still spots left. Otherwise, I look forward to co-creating magic with you at the mystic manor.